um, and some of the constraints on that and the options for the future, for, particularly for large-scale power generation. And I know others are going to be talking about what could be done in the domestic um, and service sector and so on. Um, but I thought it would be a useful way to start off because this sets the context, it sets the benchmark against which um, distributed generation or alternative supplies are going to be judged. And also I thought it would be useful to say a bit about fuel prices because that is hugely important in terms of the competitiveness of uh, uh, not just alternative energy options but demand side uh, economics as well. Um, I'm director of the Energy Intensive Users Group. I don't pretend to be impartial. I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm, I'm a lobbyist, and therefore I'm highly partial, possibly even suspect as a result of that. But at least I hope, or honestly suspect, we represent a, a coalition of uh, large industrial users and in heavy industry, if you like, some of them big emitters as well, but all of them have an interest in sustainable energy supplies and security supply and remaining competitive. And so they take their um, energy efficiency responsibilities very seriously. Um, I'm hosted by the steel division of the EPF, a manufacturer's organization, one of the sponsors um, uh, of today's event. And if you want more information about the EEF, there's a, there's a stall just as you go out um, on, on the left at the top. I'm sure my colleagues there will be happy to tell you more about that. Um, uh, what I would say is that um, increasingly we're in a, a European, if not international, world as far as energy consumers, both in the home and industry, are concerned. I'm also um, a board member of IPEC Europe, a federation that represents industrial consumers across the whole of Europe. And those of you who followed the policy debates here will know how important Europe is in determining energy policy, renewables <coughs> policy, emissions controls and, of course, building standards as well. And I can only see that influence uh, growing in the years ahead. But of course, our energy supplies are not just determined by our national or European markets. They're set in, in a truly international context. None of you, I'm sure, will require much, uh, uh, much education on what's happened about the oil price recently. It's been in all the news, and, of course, the price has been volatile. Thankfully, from a consumer point of view, it's come down <coughs> threatening the $100 a barrel. Uh, of course, one should remember that a dollar is not worth quite as worth much as it was a year ago either. Um, but nonetheless, uh, even in real terms uh, and, and currency adjusted, um, we've had some, some big changes um, in, in the price of oil recently. In my view, um, regardless of possible concerns about peak oil, which are probably a little bit overdone, or at least premature, uh, demand conditions are set to carry on growing in, in developing economies for the foreseeable future. The only issue is at what rate we can constrain that with energy efficiency and alternatives and so on. And supplies are physically constrained in the short term. So I don't think anyone should bet on front oil prices or other related energy prices consumers enjoyed in a brief period when they were in real terms uh, very low indeed, close to short run marginal cost. That was never likely to uh, last indefinitely. Uh, we've been through a step change in oil prices. I would also caution against anyone necessarily assuming that prices will stay high. And we experienced this in the 70s and 80s, oil price peaks where the price came down again. It could still happen if there was an outbreak of, who knows, you know, democracy in the Middle East or uh, liberalism in Moscow or Chavez decides socialism is not such a good idea after all. Uh, all these things are theoretically possible and they might yet come, come to pass. Um, uh, but, but without uh, those sort of changes, I suspect there are going to be other constraints, quite apart from the physical, in terms of that uh, put a risk premium on forward prices of oil. Now, why does this matter for power generation? Very little of our power generation in this country or elsewhere in Europe is actually oil driven. Well, partly because oil is a substitute fuel potentially uh, for gas, but more to the point, the gas market itself, which accounts for around 40% of the electricity production currently in the UK, and a growing proportion but a smaller one in Europe. Um, gas supplies are directly or indirectly. Some of that is a natural economic function, substitute fuels and so on. If the demand for one fuel is high internationally, you'd expect that effect to be felt on other fuels too. But part of it is somewhat artificial and there's not much we can do about it. It won't surprise you to know that the oil producers rather like linking the sales of, of gas to the price of oil, particularly at current oil prices, and they're not in a hurry to change it. As an increasing proportion of the world's future supplies are in OPEC hands, I don't think we should see an imminent change there. And the gas market is even more concentrated. The two biggest um, sets of reserves are Iran and Russia. You don't even need to construct a cartel. You just need a phone line between the two. They both know each other's business. I 
don't think we're going to see uh, an outbreak of gas to gas competition there. The LNG market, liquefied gas, which is becoming increasingly important even to the UK, remains highly tied to that for oil. So uh, my message there is that unfortunately, and it is unfortunate from an emissions point of view because gas is a relatively clean fuel, it's what I call a medium carbon fuel, a lot lower than coal. Most of the emissions reductions we've had to date in this country have come from substituting gas for coal in the power sector, a big chunk of them. Uh, at the time, that was economically the right thing to do. It saved us money, so we saved money and we reduced emissions. A perfect thing, a perfect context for politicians who didn't have to take any particularly diff difficult decisions. We got a positive outcome on both fronts. Unfortunately, we're not in that world now. It's cheap to build gas-fired generation. It's not necessarily cheap to operate it when the fuel prices are high. And that raises some issues about the future, particularly when there are issues about security of supply from imported gas. Um, a quick word on carbon prices. It's a good thing from an environmental point of view that the EU emissions trading scheme is moving into a different phase next year. From the 1st of January to 2008 to 2012, the Kyoto compliance period, we should have a more robust price of carbon. From a consumer point of view, that means more of that price or that value, I should say, will be passed through. A quick note, which will be fully understood by the economists here, but there's a difference between cost and value. Uh, the power generators will pass on the value of a unit of carbon, which is largely but not entirely going to be allocated free of charge to the power generators. Uh, they will be pricing that in as opportunity cost. They won't be giving it up for nothing. Uh, consequently, a number of the most carbon-intensive power generators will be making windfall profits out of this environmental scheme designed to reduce carbon emissions, which some of us think is rather perverse. There's a possibility that that might be corrected in 2012, but in the meantime, um, we've got a, a marginal signal which should provide some incentive to burn lower carbon fuels and switch to alternatives rather than coal, but nothing like the strength of signal uh, that will be required to create a major decarbonisation energy supplies, which in any case will take decades to achieve. Um, but as unfortunately as consumers, we're going to get this price passed through. <coughs> uh, currently, carbon is trading at about um, just under, shade under 18 euros a ton on, on the European market a couple of months ago, slightly higher. Who knows what it will be next month? But it's going to be somewhere around the high teens, low 20s, almost certainly for the first um, year or two coming. And that will cause an uplift in power prices right across um, the EU. There are other costs mentioned there to do with the climate change levy that affects business supplies, so business energy consumers are experiencing this, domestic consumers don't, um, and, and, and annually escalating costs of renewables, which are becoming quite expensive. Um, anyway, the point, point about this is that rising fuel prices and potentially rising carbon prices in the future are affecting the economics of power generation. <coughs> And this matters, the UK is particularly extreme example in Europe because we've got such a lot of plants about to retire. I've mentioned the rising cost of fuels and carbon, but, uh, and indeed the concerns over security of supply from, in terms of imported gas from the Middle East and Russia and so on, and more particularly the price at which we're going to have to ensure that security is no longer an issue. But we've got very considerable plant retirement ahead of us in the power generating industry, and that is both an issue in terms of uh, funding, but it's also an opportunity to get things right for the future in terms of heat capture and all sorts of other things about decarbonising our supplies. And to put some figures on it, if you look at the two remaining Magnox reactors and the remaining AGRs, some of which are uh, uh, you know, not exactly operating uh, terribly efficiently at the moment, I think there's about four of them out of operation, um, and, and so the question about extending their lives is a big issue, but even if, even if that doesn't occur, there's 7 gigawatts, 7,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity set to retire over the next 10 years. It might turn out to be a shame <coughs> of that if, we, um, if British Energy is successful in extending the AGR reactor lifetimes. But they're, they're effectively an old technology. They don't have much of a future. It's only a question of uh, fiddling at the fringes. The issue for that industry is are they going to be able to replace the capacity with new, with new plants. And in addition to that, and that of course tends to run as base load but in the flexible market this is increasingly important there's 12 gigawatts of oil and um, uh, particularly coal plants that is opted out of the European Union's large combustion plant directive that covers sulfur emissions and so on and all the CO2 emissions um, and that will have retired completely uh, by 2015 so 19 gigawatts of plant um, set to go, um, I should say, the, the 7 gigawatts of nuclear retirement in the next 10 years. So 
probably 19, 20 gigawatts or so of plant out of a total capacity of around about 70 um, is going to go um, by uh, within the next um, uh, 10 years uh, and similar volumes to follow. Um, so there are some big decisions for the power sector, big decisions for the demand side as well. How much of that do, do people want to co-generate, generate themselves? And to what extent can we obviate the need for great increases in capacity? I myself believe demand is going to carry on growing, but the rate at which it grows can undoubtedly be affected uh, by the efficiency with which we use energy. Um, and in particular, is there an opportunity to capture heat energy from the thermal plant we're going to need? Some of that might be biomass fired, it might not necessarily be coal or gas. Even if it is coal and gas one day, it might have carbon capture and storage to go with it. The costs of that are highly uncertain. Some people are talking about 40 euros a tonne of CO2 being a good indicative price to make carbon capture and storage viable. The answer is nobody knows at the moment. It's a bit how long it's a piece of string. If you happen to be sited right next to a depleted oil reservoir with a um, spare pipeline uh, going offshore perhaps to uh, uh, deposit the, uh, the CO2 through by reverse flow, uh, and you happen to have a, a facility that produces a clean stream of CO2 and nothing else, uh, then it's a relatively cheap operation. I'm not aware of an industrial facility that ticks all those boxes at the moment, um, so there's an uphill struggle. <laughs> Uh, so the opportunity of the engineering industry and others to develop cost-effective ways uh, of capturing carbon, which I suspect we're going to need to some degree for the foreseeable future, but it was a great opportunity there. The government are funding a demonstration project on this, but I have to say the, uh, the funding doesn't match up to the rhetoric on the, uh, on the subject. And given that the world is going to need carbon sequestration and capture technology, even if we don't exploit it that much in this country, if you look at the rate at which China and India are burning coal, we don't have a solution to our emissions problems without this being somewhere in the mix. Um, I, I do worry that that's not accelerating as fast as it should be. Um, just a quick word on potential heat recovery and distributed generation. There are a few myths about this. I'm sure this audience is sufficiently um, well informed to understand this, but the politicians and some campaigners seem to think that mysteriously, simply by decentralising energy production, um, you achieve efficiency. It's not quite as simple as that. Uh, in fact, there are a number of efficiencies which are, uh, arise simply from, from centralisation uh, of energy and not just economic ones. However, the one area where there is a great potential is, is, is distributed heat. Um, if you're looking at local um, heat distribution systems, uh, small-scale um, CHP, uh, or medium industrial scale and so on, that becomes much more viable um, with distributed generation. Problematic, I think, for micro CHP, you may hear a bit, a bit more about it from the Carbon Trust. A couple of quick slides to finish. Um, these will be distributed, I think, later, but people want to go.